good afternoon and welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series, our premier digital educational platform featuring a variety of interactive programs to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director of Events here at NCIA, and as always, I'm very excited to welcome you all to another edition of our long-running Committee Insights Series today being presented by NCIA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee. Before we do get started, a final note to our guests who are joining us for the live stream on our Facebook. We love your direct interaction with the program today. So if you're an active NCIA member, follow the short link in our description to log into your account and join the conversation inside the Zoom platform. If you're not an NCIA member, follow that join now link to activate your membership or the register now link to purchase a pass so you don't miss out on this invaluable programming. Now, let's get this show on the road. With the Mid-Atlantic poised to become the next region to ride the wave of cannabis legalization, NCIA's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee has organized a timely conversation to highlight demands advocates should be making of their lawmakers from the perspectives of those who fought these battles before in different markets. Well, I know our audience is eager to dive into today's information and our panel is ready to get started, so let's not waste any more time. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome our special guest host for today's session, Tahid Chappelle, the founder of the Can Atlantic Conference, uh, to the virtual stage to introduce our panel of esteemed experts. For those of you who might not know Tahid, uh, he is a cannabis patient, educator, journalist, and activist who focuses on ongoing inequities within the cannabis legalization movement and subsequent industry. Tahid, you can activate your video feed now and take it away from here. Thank you, Brian. And hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on this Wednesday afternoon. Um, like Brian said, my name is Tahid Chappelle. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm based in the Philadelphia region. Um, as mentioned, I founded the Can Atlantic Conference, which is a conversation around uh, equity, legalization, and injustices that we were seeing in the Mid-Atlantic region. I think the Mid-Atlantic region is a massive importance for the cannabis legalization space. Um, you have New York City, you have New Jersey, which an ACLU report in 2020 found that if you're black, you are 3.64 times more likely to be arrested for cannabis in New Jersey. Philadelphia, you have a city like Philadelphia, which has a 1.6 million population, a 44% black population, and a city that is the biggest poorest city in the world, or rather the country, uh, with a 25% poverty rate, which is pretty intense. You also have in Virginia, the South, you also have Richmond, which is uh, was likely uh, known as the uh, capital of the Confederacy. So between Virginia and New York, you have so many stakes, uh, so many people's um, lives at stakes. You have a massive amount of black populations in Virginia, DC, Philly, New York City, and Jersey. And this is an opportunity to really bring attention to a large market that is coming online as we speak. So uh, we're gonna have a, um, we're gonna have our uh, panelists uh, introduce ourselves or introduce themselves. We have um, uh, representatives from California. We have uh, representatives from New Jersey and we have representatives from Virginia. So we're gonna get a very diverse spectrum of um, insight on what is at stake for the Mid-Atlantic region. We're gonna hear about the successes and the failures of ongoing efforts to ensure that equity is at the top of every prioritization when it comes to cannabis legalization. And if you are um, curious about what's going on, if you wanna ask any questions, I encourage you to leave your questions or your comments in the chat, and I will try to get to them um, at the end of this conversation. So first, we're gonna start with Brandon. Brandon, if you don't mind turning on your video, please tell us your name, uh, your professional title, and your location. Greetings, everyone. Thank you, Tahid, so much for that that wonderful introduction. And, and you know, it's an honor to be on here today. My name is Brandon Bolton. I am from uh, the state of California, the city of Sacramento. I am a member of the United Core Alliance, a social equity organization here on the ground level of California that focuses on educational development, uh, workforce development, business development, and also now expungements. We just ran our first expungement clinic uh, two weeks ago. Um, it is an honor to be on this panel with such esteemed guests such as Tahid, Chelsea, and the others that are on this with me today. 
um, looking forward to, you know, really pushing policy or t having the conversation of, you know, equitable cannabis policies, because this is a consistent conversation and, and one that we all need to be engaging in from, you know, and, and have these statewide kind of conversations. So uh, thank you so much for, for the introduction. Thanks, Brandon. And um, we're going to get a West Coast perspective on this because we know that there's plenty to take from California. And Brandon has a bunch of information that we can learn from the West Coast. Um, Chelsea, do you mind introducing yourself, um, your name, your professional title, and um, where you're located? Thanks so much, um, Saheed. My name is Chelsea Higgs Wise, and I am the executive director of Marijuana Justice. You can find us at marijuanajustice.org or on Instagram at THC Justice Now. We are, are an we are an all black run organization that works directly to repeal, repair and bring reparations to the drug war here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So I'm really excited to share a little bit more about what's going on here in the Commonwealth and hear what's happening across the Mid-Atlantic and the entire country. Thank you, Chelsea and Charlie, do you mind um, introducing yourself, uh, your pronouns, your professional title and where you're located? Thanks for that introduction. It really is an honor to be on this panel. Super excited. Um, I'm actually an attorney in my day life in New Jersey, but I'm also the founder of Blaze Responsibly, which is my company I founded to help educate and empower other women and minorities to get into the legal industry because I navigated the process in New Jersey in 2019, having applied for a medical license and it was very challenging. Um, and so I, I feel like I, I owe it to the people to share my experiences and help wherever I can. Um, and I was also part of the NJ Ken 2020 Vote Yes initiative, which was successful, but has its issues. Um, and I'm an executive board member for the Cannabis Law Committee. So I'm really excited to be here. Thanks. Thank you all for joining. I really appreciate it. Um, and if you all do not mind putting all your videos on, we will start with the first question, which is directed to everybody. Um, first, we'll start with the West Coast um, with, with, with Brandon. Um, can you just set the scene up? For people who are who are tuning in, whether they're familiar or they don't know what's happening right now in California, what's the current situation? What's the current state of your market right now? Yeah, well, uh, back in 2016, Senator Stephen Bradford passed Senate Bill 1294, uh, which really drafted the language for cannabis equity programs to be adopted at the local levels. And so we started to see that happen. In it happened first in the city of Oakland. They have. Um, the first social equity program. And then in the city where I am from, which I'm also a social equity uh, entrepreneur myself in, here in the city of Sacramento, um, we got started in about 2018. And so a lot of these social equity programs are just starting to roll out. Um, there really aren't any mature programs here in the in the state of California, um, because they're, they're really, you know, some are just sunsetting up to their two year pilot points. Um, so we're starting to, you know, see a lot, we saw a lot of initial challenges and now we're starting to work through a lot of those initial challenges. Um, but, you know, now we're starting to see, you know, really large in community engagement. We're starting to see equitable policies. We're starting to see exclusive social equity licenses uh, be given to those most impacted by the war on drugs, you know, those communities of color. Um, you know, we're starting to see other ancillary markets adjacent to cannabis as well start to thrive in the social equity atmosphere um, in these communities. And we're just, we're, we're starting to see, you know, the, the communities start to, to thrive around the social equity um, uh, uh, industry, uh, cannabis industry. Um, so it's, it's, lovely to see you know all the wonderful things that are, are moving on the ground another thing that's moving here in the state of california uh which is you know uh, hopefully passes in, it, in my opinion uh they're uh talking about a new senate bill called 398 um, that bill will enable local jurisdictions to adopt a state developed cannabis program at the local level with a social equity component in it um, you know, and although California is looked at as a maturing industry, there are 68% of cities and counties in the state that still do not allow cannabis businesses to operate. Um, so this bill would, you know, essentially allow some of these local jurisdictions who don't have the money to pay for, you know, new ordinances and pay for these equity studies um, to actually adopt a state program, an equity program um, and tax um, the tax uh, schedule as well that would feed back into social justice and cannabis equity initiatives. So we're starting to st we're starting to see cannabis reinvest in social equity here in the state of California. 
That is, uh, that's wonderful to hear that that is moving at the state level. Um, and if you don't mind actually typing in that bill number, um, I'm sure people will be really interested in, in seeing uh, what, what that is. Um, uh, Charlie, we'll, we'll start with New Jersey. New Jersey just legalized. Um, it finally uh, created a commission and it's now just building uh, or starting to roll out the, uh, uh, you know, the conversations around regulations. You know, it's moving at a rapid pace now. What's happening in New Jersey? Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely moving quickly. Um, but I also want to remind people not to buy into the headlines because what happened with um, S21, which is the legalization bill that we passed, there's a little language in there that says, uh, once the CRC, so this Income and Cannabis Regulatory Commission gets formed, within 180 days, they're supposed to come out with rules and regulations. That's really unrealistic because even though people think the commission is formed, it's only the five members that had to be appointed that was formed. The staff, the back end, the people who are gonna be advising for these rules and regulations, that's to be to, to still happen, right? And so, because um, I've had people calling me ready to sign up and telling me they're getting quoted by attorneys six figures. And I'm like, really? Uh, we're a year away. How are you gonna hold on to your property for a year? You know, do you have the resources? So it's like, it's scary times right now. There's a lot of misinformation um, happening, but um, maybe I can highlight just some of the good things so that people can be, you know, aware of it. Um, at least 30% of licenses are supposed to go to certified women-owned, minority-owned, or disabled veterans, which is a start. We're not equal. 30% is nowhere near what we need to be at, but it's something. And what is also happening is that there's going to be an office of women, minority, veteran, cannabis uh, business development to be formed to hold um, the state accountable to make sure that those licensing percentages are actually met. So when you put accountability at the framework, it says something because we haven't seen it in the past, at least with the medical programs and a lot of other states with their equity programs, it's great on paper. And then when it comes to execution, it's a whole different story. Um, so that's a, that's a benefit. And New Jersey's now for adult use, at least, we have several different licensing categories and they added a delivery, which I think is good because it's probably the least expensive license to obtain and sustain from an application and infrastructure standpoint. So they're creating a little bit of opportunity there. Um, and another thing that's worth mentioning is that the commission has the opportunity to take a portion of what's gonna be called a social um, equity excise tax. It's only on cultivation um, operators, but they're allowed to take that to set up um, low interest loans, startup grants, uh, application fee assistance, which is huge. And that would be ideal if the state can actually pull it through. But New Jersey had to add a roadblock because they put that it's subject to the state's annual appropriation bill. So it's tied to the state budget, which is a big problem. Um, so that's why I want to remind people, like the language looks really good on paper, but when you really look into it and you read into it and dissect it, it's not the best. Um, so I don't feel that great right now <laughs> representing New Jersey. Yes, I'm happy that the arrests are gonna stop, but I wanna make sure, what about the people who are still sitting in jail? How are we gonna address that? What about automatic expungements? Like there's so much work that still needs to be done. So we're really just at the beginning of it. Um, I don't want, I don't know if you want me to talk about negatives, but. <laughs> we're gonna get to that, uh, trust me. I'll say um, that. Yeah, and you know, it, it'll be interesting, like I had mentioned in the intro that, you know, ACLU came out with that report in 2020 saying that, if you were black in New Jersey, you were 3.64 times le more likely to be arrested for cannabis. I'm wondering what that number is gonna look like next year. I'm very interested in seeing that. Um, Chelsea, uh, Virginia, um, moved really quickly too. And look where you are. We can say that you legalized cannabis, but really not really. What, what, what do you, what's going on there? So our current state of what uh, legalization is in Virginia is that we actually have a couple more weeks that we can still advocate to the governor to repeal the prohibition of simple possession this year. So as Charlie was mentioning that at least the arrests have stopped, that's where we want to go. We want to at least stop the arrests. Even with decriminalization that was implemented in 2020, we FOIA'd that information just last month. And what we saw is that even with decrim, the arrests have gone down, but the folks that are still penalized by simple possession are disproportionately black. In fact, in Virginia, that same ACLU report that you talked about in 2020 showed in Virginia that you were four times more likely if you were black to be policed for marijuana. Well, unfortunately, even after decrim, guess what the stats was 
four times more likely to be policed if you're black, even after decrim. So our ask right now is for everyone to please, if you are in Virginia, to send out our action alert. And um, that can be some, I'm actually dropping it to the panelists, I believe someone else could share that with the attendees in one second. Um, if you're in Virginia to have your voice heard, you just fill out your information. It has our language already in there with our partners with the ACLU of Virginia who have been great uh, really working on this policing issue with us. So um, to answer your question, right now as the language stands, because nothing has been signed, let's be very clear. Just like Charlie was saying, headlines can, can really mislead folks. There has nothing signed by the governor. So we can't even really see, say that we've legalized it yet for 2024. Um, so we're still in the amendment process where even our legislators, particularly black led legislate, black legislators, progressive legislators um, who set out the vote because it did not hold this repeal language. It did not hold the resentencing language. It did not hold the release language. It actually, the only thing that Virginia passed, um, this is really important for people to hear. The only thing that Virginia passed was to set up the Virginia Cannabis Regulatory Body, the Virginia Cannabis Control Authority, to so that they could start and be ready in 2024. A lot of the social equity figures told us come back next year. Policing, come back next year. Crimes on youth, come back next year. Repeal, come back next year. Literally the only thing that the Virginia legislators decided was that we're gonna have some kind of way to collect profit, but told the people, wait. Hey, and so um, fortunately, after two years, because Marijuana Justice and ACLU and Rise for Youth um, have been working on this for two years, particularly around the policing, the desperate policing part, which is why we named our organization Marijuana Justice. We believe in the in industry inclusion, but what we've seen across the country and watching folks is that even with the industry inclusion, which has not been great, the policing and the funding towards how we are still policed around marijuana has actually gotten worse in many places. And I'm looking at you, Brandon, in California, right? And so um, we're really trying to have the focus of, yes, we're gonna be included in this industry and you're not gonna just put more money into policing black people in a different way. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but some good points, uh, but really quickly um, that we did get in that again, we'll visit next year um, were that number one, we ban vertical integration except for um, medicinal companies so that they can also provide this to patients as well as being co-located on their spots. And then certain guardrails uh, for once our commercial market starts to be implemented. So that was something that we were really excited as well as with that exception of vertically integrating for our medicinals, they pay $1 million into our social equity fund that we have called our cannabis equity reinvestment fund that is not conscious, is not subject to the budget <laughs> is completely different. Uh, yes. And so that is actually the startup money so that in 2024, when our social equity applicants operators need a zero to low interest loan, that money will be ready for them. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're also really excited that we were able to get in an independent agency. Virginia governor actually wanted this to be under ABC. And I don't know if y'all have ever tried to buy liquor in, in Virginia before, but it's an ABC store. Y'all didn't want that. So anyway, um, we were able to get an independent agency last like last minute to the conference they included our language of micro businesses which i never thought was going to be a thing so we ban vertical integration but we said hey if you're going to do that we do want this integration for our micro businesses so that was a huge political advocacy informing point to our legislators had never heard of this concept before um, so really excited for that. And then finally, our social equity language um, is in there. We have a social equity program. We're still working on defining the impacted zones and the applicant for next year. But we are excited for having that framework there. Um, wish we had done more on removing the policing, but um, I'm gonna can, you're going to hear me say a couple of times, if you're in Virginia, this is how you can help us out these next two weeks. Wow, Virginia. OK. All right. Well, y'all are moving. Um, you know, speaking of last minute, uh, Brandon, we're going to start with you on this question. Uh, you know, you've been advocating in Sacramento in the north part, uh, down in Long Beach in the south part. Um, speaking of last minute, you know, there was an update that happened around Long Beach and licenses. Can you just talk a little bit about 
you know, what were the strategies and tactics that you were doing in Long Beach to advocate for equity? You know, were they the same tactics you were using in Sacramento? Are there like universal tactics that people who want to be able to get involved in the advocacy of equity that people can be using to get the wins that you just got? Yes, definitely. Uh, so the, the win that Tahid is uh, graciously speaking of is, you know, I spent five and a half hours on a city council meeting yesterday uh, to give two minutes of public comment with, you know, other members of uh, the Long Beach community. And it was all in support of a recommendation um, that we have advocated the, the city to do um, to create eight new retail licenses in the city of Long Beach that are exclusive to social equity members and to do so in a process that is, you know, favorable for those equity members so we can reserve, you know, the profit sharing and ownership percentages on those. Um, and so I, I, yesterday we, you know, we got that set, you know, that motion passed unanimously um, and it was beautiful. It, we all called each other as a group, you know, all, all about like 10 of us plus in the community. And, you know, we talked about our next steps. And I do definitely think that, you know, the work that I'm doing here in, in Sacramento is, is the same work that I'm doing in Long Beach. It's just engaging the community, you know, finding local community leaders or just the stakeholders in general who want to educate themselves on how they can start advocating for more equitable cannabis policies and getting wins in their, you know, respective city. And, you know, we form these groups together. We share best practices from Sacramento to San Diego to, you know, Long Beach. And we say, this is what's working, you know, here. This is what isn't working here. And we communicate with those different uh, policymakers as well in all of those different jurisdictions. And we try to bring everyone to the table so that way, you know, we can come up to those best practices. But I truly believe that a lot of the work that I, you know, that led to being that those licenses being implemented um, is going to be a lot of the same work that, you know, we need to continue continuously open up these cities and counties, um, which is really just educating the city um, and the staff that we need this opportunity here in California. Cal cannabis is an is, is essential business. So, you know, when Long Beach, when they don't have delivery only licenses or they don't have retail dispensary licenses or even manufacturing licenses available for the social equity members, you know, I am I like to educate them on the reasons and use other markets as examples for why we need this and urgently as well. Um, especially now that a lot of these, these counts or these uh, cities in uh, California are, you know, uh, essentially bragging about some of the tax monies that they're getting. Um, and so as they continue to brag about that, I kind of throw that right back into their faces as well and say, hey, this is something that you said on record um, and, you know, arm the community. We all, right prior to that city council meeting, we all hopped on the call even days before. And, you know, we all got our public comments ready. We all, you know, got ready to amplify one another's voices. Um, and we all are educating ourselves and the community. So I think that this is definitely a, a, a franchisable thing. And, you know, I think it's going to look a little bit different in every city and every jurisdiction and state because it's just different. Um, but I think that, you know, as long as we have what the base foundation of that is, which is just community engagement, support from the communities of colors who want this to happen, um, that's the first step. Um, that's a great setup. Uh, we have success. We see success when we work together, when we when we train each other, when we educate each other on on best practices and things that we're seeing in other markets. Um, and you know that that is critical to to make sure that even things that maybe you know seemed as small steps or major steps in the direction of equity. Um, Charlie, let's you know we're going to circle back to New Jersey. Um, there has been so much advocacy for equity and legalization. Um, for, for New Jersey. Um, but the bill, as we know, as you and I know, as, as some people know, 821 S21 isn't the most equitable bill still, despite all the um, amount of uh, activity that's been going on for years. Um, you mentioned, you know, the negatives, you can talk about that. But, but also, can you just talk about, you know, what are some cautionary tales of, of what's happening in New Jersey, despite legalization? Yeah, the, the problem is, um, one, New, New Jersey is probably one of the capitals of big pharma. We have a lot of pharmaceutical companies who have lobbyists for years who were spending a lot of money in Trenton to influence rules and regulations. That's one aspect of it. And, and then you have the lobbyists in the cannabis industry that are lobbying for multi-state operators and they wanna 
influence the industry in a certain way. And these are public records. You can see the donations that were made to political campaigns. And so you know who's talking to who. And so when you have advocates who don't have that power of money cutting checks um, or potentially having the right in, um, even the right in might not be it because you need to have money walks in New Jersey. That's the reality. Um, if you can cut a check to the right people, then they're going to listen to you because I spent years um, trying to get somebody to listen, right? Sending letters, testifying in the Senate and aligning with the good organizations and everybody fought really hard. Um, and all they would say, the senators and assemblymen, women, they would be, they'd be like open to the conversations and open door policy, come on in, you know, like share your ideas and thoughts. But if at, at the end, it never got included because the voices that are controlling Trenton are way too loud. Um, and so how do we figure out, it's, the, the challenge is how can smaller groups come together to really stand up? And part of that is by creating you know, things like what Brendan and Chelsea spoke about, equitable best practices. Because my belief is unless you show them how to do it, they have no idea. Even though New Jersey stated we went to Colorado and we looked at what they did, well, you probably didn't because they took years to get it right. And they went through a lot of mistakes. And so we have examples of states you know, to look at. Um, and so it's frustrating, but my, the little silver lining that I have is that this incoming CRC, Jeff Brown and Diana Wainu, um, she was with the ACLU. She's a strong black woman and she's gonna run this show. Jeff Brown was the former commissioner of the, um, the medical program. He cares about the patients because I don't want the medical program to falter like it has in other states because I care about that. So when you have two people like that coming together, I feel like the gloves are going to come off and they really get to dictate the show. And that's where we get to do our part right now, which is helping influence those rules and regulations that are going to be shaped because they're going to need an advisory board. They're going to need staff members. And so people who are like us who want to do the right thing can get involved right now. Um, and so that's just something that I wanted to add. Um, if I can just really quickly mention the negative because we have micro licenses in New Jersey. And so everybody's really excited. Like, yeah, we have micro licenses, which seems like a win, but they've actually set such a difficult requirement because you have to be a hundred percent owner of, as a New Jersey resident, which sounds really good. I understand they wanna give incentives to New Jersey residents, but when it comes to raising money, unless you can self fund yourself, to pay for that, how are you going to give up equity to an out-of-state partner who has experience or has money, even if they did 90% residency, you could have gave out 10% of equity and got the money you needed, got the experience you needed to build your plan. Instead, they're like, they're tying your hands because they're like, we have micro licenses, but you have to raise your own money. And the income requirements are you can't make more than 200K. If you live in the state of New Jersey, even when you make $200,000 after your bills and all of your expenses, you're not left with that much in savings. So are you gonna dump in all of your savings for this license? Um, that's a gamble, right? It's really, it's, it's difficult for people. Um, and so I just wanna caution people with micro licenses, like just wait a little bit and let these rules get fleshed out before you just start uh, paying people for your business plans and things like that, because you don't need to rush right now. Like right now, just do your homework and, and slow down a little bit. Um, oh, segue, perfect, perfect. Do your homework. Prepare. You have to prepare. Chelsea, I'm just going to toss this one up to you. Can you talk about the prep work? Can you talk about the work that allowed you to say reparations and people knew exactly what you were talking about? Go for it. Yeah. So I just really want to lift everything that Shirali just said, because the voices that are in the room, um, why I have chosen to do this very public push, because you can't ignore us but so much. Um, if we're so public, um, it's just so important. And I learned that the hard way of not being listened to. And so my pre preparation work was a lot of things that I felt like didn't work. But something that did really work that we actually follow from out in New York and some folks that have been working with DPA for a while was to do a study. Now, again, what Shirali said, we have to be really careful about how we do these studies and how we look at other states. So we were really intentional when we um, actually saw that there was a study happening in Virginia. We looked at that bill language all and none of it had anything to do with social equity, unfortunately. And so we went to a senior a senior senator, this was in 2020 last year, when we were working on decrim, right? No one's even talking about legalization. The uprisings of the summer have not happened. Everyone's thinking legalization is years and years and almost people tell them it'll never happen in Virginia in the South. 
but we saw this this study coming and it was actually just a work group not even a study and so we went to a senior senator senator mcclellan who's actually a black woman running for governor right now but she had that clout that voice that people would listen to it was already in general assembly so we were again asking a lot okay to to propose a whole resolution that um, would have this study. Now in Virginia, we have um, an, a body called JLARC that is an independent body that does legislative uh, study reviews. So prior to me even going to this legislator, I'd gone to them and said, are you all interested in this? The way Virginia works, they get to kind of decide. So looking at what your state does and how your state does studies, what studies and what bodies do studies, because some, some legislators wanted me to go to the crime commission to do a study. I said right there, I don't want, <laughs> I'm not going to the crime commission, <laughs> um, by the way. So, and, um, but they, that's where they wanted the study to come from. Because again, the, the allowing this to continue to criminalize folks was the pattern that cannabis had been taking in Virginia prior to groups coming in, looking at the legislation for that. So we wrote out the bill ourselves with ACLU of the study, what we wanted to see, what we wanted to see from each state. We worked with this body over the summer to see what they were looking at. Now, um, this is a very in-depth report that came out in November, right before our body, our, our General Assembly proposed the bills in January, right? And it was for this timing. Um, even though they told us it would never be this year, but let's just say, thank goodness for timing and we made them have it done quickly, right? Um, now with that study, it wasn't perfect. I'm gonna tell you, I don't love everything in it, but especially on the regulatory things, we were able to point out what was good, what was bad. And this was the only point that we had a lot of times to inform the legislators when they looked at me like a I mean, I'm an, I'm an organizer, y'all. You know, I've been in the summer and the streets. People know me as a as a as a police anti policing organizer. I'm like, what are you doing in marijuana? And I was like, you don't know what I'm doing in marijuana if I'm organizing against police. Um, but this is how disconnected these issues are, right? And so when people weren't listening to me, it was the advocates and the experts in the room with JLARC that showed up and were able to, to give these points of, no, not under ABC. They even made a beautiful little chart that said why an independent agency versus ABC would actually give more equity. I mean, they gave great things that we could point to. They have a huge map that goes through each district of Virginia and, and and so I know in Richmond, we were six times more likely if we were black. In Arlington, they were 14 more. It goes through that and it gives a even a little bit more than the ACLU reports, right? So, and then that's how we were able to get this cannabis reinvestment fund. So these are the points that we've said. So look at to who else was doing this. Look at what Illinois was doing. How Illinois didn't do it great, right? And, and unfortunately things are moving so quickly and I'm, I'm gonna end, uh, wrap up to reparation soon. Even in, in New Jersey, I was following to you all through December, through now, like still informing the legislators, well, the update on equity is actually this, because it changes so much because we're learning every day, y'all. So why did I know reparations? Because marijuana and the drug war has always been the gateway to the drug war. It's not just about cannabis, y'all. It's about a community of people that have been marginalized because of a plant. And so when we're looking at reparations, I, I, I see the conversation happening and some, some few points about reparations are an official acknowledgement, an apology and public education memorials for that. We're doing that now, right? All these research studies to say what's impacted. We need re-education of that. That's something we're still working on. Um, compensation for specific and defined groups. Well, hey, we can define the group that was emphasized and impacted, right? From arrest, from convictions to the family members. Yeah, this is this is part of these reparations infrastructure. Um, looking at action to restore individuals. These are expungements, these are release, these are resentencing, right? These are the steps of what a real reparation structure should look like. Actions to stop the systems. So repealing the prohibition, taking cops out of um, enforcing marijuana, figuring out what that looks like. And then, of course, lastly, changing laws and institutions. And so building up groups for active lines of defense, I'm telling you, they're really trying to pull a fast one on young people here in Virginia with recriminalizing the laws and, and what that looks like with legalization. Um, shout out to what New Jersey was able to pull up with your young people because Virginia don't see it that way. 
And, and so when I, when I'm able to talk about reparations and the prep work, y'all, what I say is know your space, get a study done that they can't ignore and look at what the reparation standpoint structure can do for your area to really, to build something sustainable in a new institution that, that can't be quickly recriminalized. Like we've seen so much since rest reconstruction, right? Like this is what, this is what they're good at. And we're not, we shouldn't allow that to just happen with the cannabis industry. Ooh, well said. Um, I'm going to take a brief uh, pause to let people know that if you are tuning in and watching, please make sure to uh, leave your questions in the uh, comments, in the uh, Zoom comment, Zoom chat box. Uh, I will try to get to some of your comments at the end of the uh, Q&A with the panelists, but wow. Okay. So that has been uh, a lot of information y'all. And, you know, the, the question that I have for everybody, and this is, you know, a, a free for all for this one is, you know, activism and being involved in organizing, mobilizing, doing this work, often voluntary, like often voluntary, like you're, you're, you're often just volunteering your time to do this. It can be exhausting. It can be overwhelming. Can any, can you, can any of y'all talk about just really about balancing the amount of work that it does take to really achieve some of these accomplishments can you talk about you know making sure that people are finding space to 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 breathe and to collect themselves and keep their composure uh everyone is running at a thousand miles per hour what does it take to to not get overwhelmed in this type of work that is so necessary and critical i'll open it up to everybody passion you have to love what you're doing because I mean, I'm sure all of us, like I work a full-time job and then I work another full-time. So it's like the, I've become used to now being okay with 12 hours because I realized like the daytime, I need the paycheck. I need to, I need to survive. And the rest of this is like my dream. That's my, that's my purpose. And I know what I'm fighting for is for the greater good. So the fear is out of it. There's no more fear. There's no more exhaustion. It's just like, I got to do this because I waited too long to do this. And that's why I feel like I can't be part of that failure, right? Like, I feel like I could have spoken up earlier in New Jersey, um, but I was waiting because I thought there was going to be other people that will, that were going to do it. Um, and then I realized when you want something to be done the right way or your way, whatever that is, then you just need to go out there and do it. And so I find balance by reminding myself consistently, I am enough. I'm fully capable, just like everybody else. I will stay in my lane, stay focused, and there's enough for everybody. Like I believe in the circle economy and the universe and good people and good intentions. And so I just want to remind people, you have days where you feel really down and it's hard. Hey, you got cannabis, right? Like I could just, I could, I feel a lot better then. And I know because I love it so much. And so it's like, you just come back to like, what is your purpose in all of this? Remind yourself as many times as it takes, but this is the work that we need to do. And so, you know, I mean, I'm here for that. I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly agree, um, you know, spending that five and a half hours on the call, like it's volunteered my time to do that. And it's, it was for the community members down there. And what made, what makes this such an incredible in, in dream for myself is just those conversations after, you know, a five hour city council meeting with, you know, multiple community stakeholders there that are all that are from communities of color um, that have been you know disproportionately impacted and just the way that we can you know really come up with game plans together on how to move the policy and we're sophisticating ourselves we don't know we didn't understand how to do this work you know we had to learn how to do this work we're still learning how to do this work and the most efficient ways to do this and it takes that passion it takes one another you know there's some days where i just completely want to give up and you know there's my business partner my community members they will not let me and i will not let them um you know so i, I really think it's it's us it's each other it's these conversations that continuously drive us and drive myself i'm gonna say yes to all that join an organization follow people don't do this by yourself even if you feel like you're by yourself in your state which might be true i'm not gonna lie to y'all um follow other people across the country because that's how we did it um i am lucky enough to work for this organization but i built this from the ground this did not exist two years ago and um i don't get paid very much but i do make sure that folks that help us that are black are getting paid and so um it, it is a lot but it's like i you have to have the passion, but join and don't feel alone. 
Charlie, there was something that you mentioned about micro businesses or micro licenses in New Jersey that they were good on paper, but there were certain lines of words and language that put together actually uh, made it a lot more difficult than people seemed. Um, this is a question for everybody. You know, how can we help community members who may not be versed in policy, really, who never, you know, I didn't, I wasn't reading bills years ago, like I just started reading bills and starting to understand the policy and a little bit of the language, but for people starting off when, when they're introduced in activism, and you know, they're, they're said, hey, you should go read the bill and see what it says, how can people build their acumen so that they actually understand the words, what they mean, what the impacts are, or what the interpretations can open things up for, I'll, I'll open that up for everybody, because obviously, we all look at different language, how do you how do you make sense of it? For, I obviously have a, a bias because I went to law school, so I have that advantage where I. Have, if you're a lawyer, then it's easier, I guess. Yeah, really, yeah, but I have that. Um, but for anybody else, like I recommend going to like what Brendan said and, and Chelsea, right? Going to like public forums. There are city council meetings weekly. There are state uh, meetings that are happening on a regular basis. So attending these public meetings, which are now virtual is the best thing that you can do to learn what people are, what terminology is being used, how it's being said, watching and learning is the best way. And it may seem tedious, but reading the bills multiply, like it'll help you because I read bills two, three times, maybe even more. And then I understand what I actually just read. The first time it's like, what is this? And, and, I'm, and it's coming from somebody who should know how, but it's not easy language. And they do that on purpose because they want you to be confused and convoluted. And I just have to give an example of my favorite word, which is may. May is not mandatory. May is not shall. May is an option. May will change the entire, it dilutes the power of that provision tremendously. And people don't realize that. They see may and they're like, oh, look at this. They're going to do that. No, that's, that's not mandatory. And so it really is critical to know, to know, you know, what the legislative intent is, what the purpose is and how these words interact. Um, but if you don't have anybody to reach out, I mean, I'm a resource, I'm happy to help at any point. And I'm sure there's other partners, organizations that people can tap into, but really watching in real time how the legislature uh, votes on things, that's the best way you can understand and just reading as much as possible. I agree. I, I agree again. Um, I take advantage of it being, you know, a virtual experience right now because uh, I know when I was first getting started about two years ago, I was getting lots of parking tickets trying to figure this out, you know, down in City Hall. I didn't know where to park. I didn't know how to even submit public comment. And I was just sitting in the room for six hours like, what is going on? But, you know, <laughs> that is, you know, throw yourself into, you know, the fire and just, in, in, you know, you'll find like-minded individuals and, you know, you'll start to group together and educate one another. Chelsea, I saw you. What, what do you got to say? I agree with it all. Make sure you are working. I just want to say work with other people. Like if you're in Virginia or have questions, feel free to reach out and DM me. Like some of this language is, is ridiculous for you to read so many times when you can maybe just ask people. And something someone told me is that if you're showing you're working hard, then other people are going to want to help you. So just remember that too, but definitely may versus shall, come on. Language is important folks, devil's in the details. Uh, there was also mention, um, uh, I'll circle back to this question too, before we get to the last question, then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, but um, New Jersey is the, Pharma capital, sure. There's a lot of pharmacy companies here. There's a lot of pharmacy and hospitals in Philly too. Uh, you know, we we are up against Goliaths, honestly, who have a lot of money and resources. We know that these multi-state operators are forming coalitions with each other already. We've seen that in Jersey. We've seen that in Massachusetts. They're all over the place. How do we work together? How do we build a base? And you know, still in a pandemic, build capacity to get people to care about this, that they want to spend some of their time supporting this or working uh, on, on, on these types of initiatives. How do, we, how do we make sure that we're educating people, but we're also making sure that people recognize that this is an urgent thing that can be addressed immediately? I'll open that up to the group. Yeah, if, um, I, I really believe in the power of unity. And so I've been recently asking the universe to send like-minded people my way 
because I know what I need to do, I can't do alone. I need a team of people who care about the same reasons and want to do the work that's required. Um, and MSOs may have the resources, but they may not necessarily have their ear to the streets. They don't know the market that they're trying to serve. They didn't live in Newark for five years. I did. I know what it's like. I can speak to that. And, um, and it shows because despite all the raises that they're doing, they're not even really profitable. So that should say a lot to people too. So I feel like um, the fear holds people back from reaching out to other people and collaborating. So it's like removing that element, just like what Chelsea said, reaching out to people and connecting because I really do think when you get together, you can change the narrative. But if you're trying to do it on your own, it just sometimes feel like, it does feel like a lie. It's like you're going up against this huge battle, but when you join forces, it's so much, um, it's so much easier. And um, the other thing I think is just to, make sure that you walk away when you feel bad vibes. Um, I've navigated, there's plenty of sharks in this industry. So you initial conversations may be great. And then when you get down the road, so just be careful when you are trying to find the right people, um, you know, go off of energy. Like there's a reason why you get that gut feeling. Definitely. I like to use the word solidarity, work in solidarity with folks and support their work while you might have some downtime if it's within your capacity. I say for smaller orgs, community orgs, find fellowships, find um, right now it might not be like a social equity cannabis one, but there are ones for, you know, divesting and investing and, and, and how to do that with other, you know, drug war and decrim all there are ways to intersectionally do this to find these like-minded people that we're talking about. So also relational organizing, I'm really big into that. It's another one of those terms that actually just means like get to know people. Um, and that way stuff comes up and it's like, oh wait, I know someone that you could talk to. And um, and then really just builds from there. So I, I really wanna encourage folks in this virtual world where we, uh, it, it actually makes us a lot closer and smaller if you have the access to, to these virtual tools. I agree with all those points and I actually took some notes based off what you said, Chelsea, so thank you. <laughs> Excellent, listen, we wanna educate people. So I hope everyone's taking a copious amount of, amount of notes. Uh, we're at 3.50, so we're about 10 minutes. Uh, we're gonna do one last question. I'll see if there's any audience Q and A's and then we will wrap it up. Um, so the last question, you know, given everything that we've talked about, uh, California is moving, um, New Jersey is, coming up. Virginia's got some time, but there's a lot, there's always a lot of work to do. Next year, Chelsea, there's a lot of things that's going to be happening next year, it looks like. Uh, so things are moving in the Mid-Atlantic region, and we're seeing things happening in the West Coast that we could all be taking notes from as well. Given everything that everyone has talked about, Brandon, we'll start with you first. What are some immediate action items that people can be taking right now, whether it's in their community, whether they're in California, what are some kind of action items that you would give listeners and viewers, those that want to get involved in this or those that are, are considering getting involved but may not know how to? I'll start with you. Definitely. I would start by going to all of our organization's websites, you know, because we have a lot of resources that will direct them. Um, but, you know, really, if you are in an area that, you know, may not have cannabis equity or even cannabis, I always recommend people just to, you know, start looking at other markets and other groups and start participating with those groups in the discussions. Um, they might not be, you know, as relatable to your market, but there it's cannabis and it's social equity. So you, you can make that audible, you know, when when you're in your respective area um oops sorry about that um and so um yeah just just really that sorry sorry i lost my train of thought uh chelsea i'll go i'll go same question to you Okay, great. So um, number one, thank you for following marijuanajustice.org and subscribing at marijuanajustice.org. You can also find the donate button and become a monthly don donor to Marijuana Justice, even if you're not in Virginia. No sustainable investment into us is too small. Uh, we are really trying to next build out some of this information for other states in the South. I saw that there was a question about conservative states and what we understand in Virginia legislature, and we are not a referendum state, so we have to do things very differently. And so um, continue to support us at marijuanajustice.org. Uh, make sure if you're in Virginia to sign that action alert uh, done by our partners at the ACLU to tell Governor Northam to repeal the 
to repeal the possession of um, the simple possession of marijuana this year and please do not wait. And um, also, if you are looking to talk about marijuana, y'all, let's let's not just talk about legalizing it. We really want to start a narrative legalizing it right. And so hashtag legalize it right is what we're encouraging people to use because we can't just legalize it anymore. We got to know it's about intention and doing it the right way. And maybe we can create that right way together. So I'm really excited. So thanks so much for everyone uh, following Marijuana Justice and on socials, it's THC Justice Now. That was awesome. Um, I'm going to definitely connect with you, Chelsea and Fred, and both of you guys. Um, so anybody in New Jersey and beyond, please connect with me. Find me on LinkedIn or Instagram, Blaze Responsibly. I post a lot of free information um, just about the industry in general. I'm really trying to give attorneys a run for their money because I'm done watching people get ripped off. So I'm going to build best practices. I'm going to put together a workshop series, literally just trying to give you guys um, resources and tools so that you can be better equipped for when it comes time for you guys to have the conversations and start with your plans. Um, so if you're really looking to get involved, reach out. If you have ideas on how to improve the legislation, future rules and regulations, like I mentioned, the time is really right now because our incoming Cannabis Regulatory Commission is just being formed. So use me as a resource and stay safe, blaze responsibly. I wanted to squeeze one last question and I'm gonna to toss this one to Chelsea. Chelsea, the question is, how do you deal with haters? You know, you're in marijuana justice. You also run a successful uh, race capital podcast, which is amazing. Uh, you run your own media outlet uh, with your partners. So how do you deal with the haters real quick? Let, let's just end there real quick. Solidarity with other people. I keep saying you can't do this alone because the haters are going to be there. And, um, you know, so in conservative states, gather your like minded thinkers. Remember, this is a prison justice, prison reform topic. This is a policing topic. This is a farming topic. This is a land back conversation, right? So this is uh, truly a conversation to, to build more. So, how do I deal with the, deal with the haters? Um, have a group chat that I can trust and just vomit, <laughs> react in instead of doing it publicly um, and be ready for those same narratives to come up in legalization and legislation and be ready to fight back with data, experience and collective voice. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Brandon Bolton from California, Charlie Patel from New Jersey, Chelsea Higgs Wise from Virginia and me from the Philadelphia region, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. Uh, thank you all for your wonderful, wonderful conversation, your wonderful advice, your wisdom, your perspective. Uh, thank you NCIA for allowing us to organize this and make this come to life. Uh, Brian, I'm gonna pass it off to you and we will be sharing our contact information. Please be sure to follow us all on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, yada, yada. Uh, and thank you for watching everybody, Brian. Fantastic, Tahid. Well, thank you, first off, for leading such an informative and insightful conversation with our panel today. And thank you, Brandon, Chelsea, and Chirali as well for taking the time out of your very, very busy schedules uh, leading the fight for cannabis reform on the East Coast each. So thank you all so much. Um, if you all enjoyed the session today, why don't you give some feedback to our panel um, by uh, participating in a virtual round of applause. If you enjoyed today's panel session, yeah, raise your hand in the audience pool. We'll all get those pop-up notifications. We love to see that. Fantastic. Um, and again, <clears throat> as uh, Tahid and the other panelists mentioned, please do make note of the contact information and social handle information contained on this contact slide. Uh, we will be sharing a PDF presentation of today's uh, <clears throat> slide deck so that you all have that as reference as well. And then um, additionally, stay on the lookout to your email inbox as you all will be the first ones to receive a formatted video recording of today's session alongside all of the NCIA members that participate in our members only community platform, NCIA Connect. Um, so stick around for a few moments. Um, we're gonna close out today's program with our typical outro of the segment. Um, and if you all want to participate and engage with the uh, panelists inside the chat room during that time, uh, feel free to do so. And then any additional questions that you might have that pop into your head, post them onto the Q&A board. And we'll use that as a launching off point for a post-broadcast conversation inside of NCIA Connect later this week. 
Okay, perfect. Well, for all of you all that are currently not an NCIA member, I do want to make note that we currently have nine webinars scheduled between now and the middle of April, which are all free for current NCIA members. If you're not an NCIA member, please activate your membership today to gain access to this and all the other amazing benefits offered. Um, or you can continue to purchase those non-member passes to continue engaging with all of our invaluable programming prior to taking the plunge on an annual commitment. <clears throat> All right, and with that, thank you all so much for participating in another NCIA Industry Essentials educational webinar. Um, as someone who got my start in the drug policy reform uh, field in cannabis industry uh, by joining a Students for Sensible Drug Policy chapter at the Virginia Commonwealth University and College, uh, I can't thank Chelsea and all of the other activists that are um, really leading the fight for an equitable uh, industry on the East Coast. So first off, um, a huge heartfelt thank you um, from everyone here at NCIA for all of the efforts that our panel um, are coordinating on their fronts. Uh, huge thank you as well to all of the members of our Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee for presenting today's session along with our audience members and, of course, the member businesses, uh, which make our work possible each and every day. Yeah, Chelsea, it's, it's awesome looking at your all's website and seeing so many familiar faces. <laughs> uh, please complete the attendee survey after leaving the meeting room. This will grant you all immediate access to our presentation file. And as I noted previously, do note all NCIA members receive exclusive 30-day access to all the formatted video recordings of our industry essentials webinars that are first posted in our NCIA members only community, NCIA Connect. As always, we'll leave you all with this end of event credit sequence highlighting the 20 plus member businesses that make up the diversity, equity and inclusion committee for this term, as well as all the member businesses that participated in the session as well. If you don't see your company included, that means you need to head to the cannabisindustry.org slash join following today's session to join the movement for a responsible and equitable cannabis industry. To switch things up again uh, a bit, we'll showcase some lo-fi audio stylings by yours truly. I hope you all enjoy, and we look forward to seeing you all next week for another Industry Essentials educational webinar. See you next time.